All right, well, thank you, Wendy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the acting director at the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System. And I'd like to welcome you to our November Wyoming Conditions and Outlooks uh, webinar briefing, which was put together this month by my office, along with the University of Wyoming Extension and USDA, uh, the Northern Plains Climate Hub, the US Geological Survey, and the National Weather Service. The update will look at uh, current climate conditions followed by the surface water status in Wyoming and then weather forecasts and outlooks. And then we'll finish up with how you can participate and help in the drought monitoring process. So getting started, this is the current drought monitor map. Uh, for those of, on the webinar who are new, this is a weekly product that is updated every Tuesday and it is released each Thursday morning. So this just came out this morning. Uh, the, Areas circled in green are all areas that we've seen improvements in at least one category since our, our last webinar. Uh, many of these improvements were continuations resulting from the precipitation, which was mostly in the form of snow that came several weeks ago and uh, which has made its way into the soil column. And this may be the first time where all areas of change on the map uh, have been green since we started doing these briefings. So that was, that was a good sign. This is the 14 day total precipitation as a percentile for the state of Wyoming. Uh, over the last two weeks, we've got some uh, areas of concern here in Fremont, uh, the Bighorn Basin down here in the Southeast where we're, we're seeing these, these darker, deeper red colors. But we've also had some areas up above the median, a little bit up in the Northwest here, and then the, uh, the Central and Eastern Plains here where we've been seeing above median precipitation. And this is the same map, but looking back a 90 day period, uh, we can see we were, when you capture the full 90 days, we're a lot uh, wetter, uh, especially here in the center part of the state, coming down in the South Central and Sweetwater, Carbon County, and then moving up here into the, into the Eastern Plains and a little bit up into the Northwest or Northeast. And then also the Bighorn Basin, Fremont County, and over here in Lincoln County, we were seeing above median precipitation. Uh, at the 90 day period, uh, a little dry up in the Park County area, as well as uh, the south uh, eastern portion, especially Laramie County and the very southern part of uh, Alderman County. Yeah, this is the standardized precipitation index. It's not quite precipitation, but it is, you know, for those of you unfamiliar with the product, the SPI takes a look at precipitation totals over, over various time intervals and it fits them into a normal distribution. And from how those values are distributed, we can see how a, a certain value will fit into the distribution uh, and get an idea of how far that away is away from the median or the, the middle value. And in doing so, it's a very useful metric for looking at drought categories since the drought categories on the US drought monitor are based upon how often a particular condition occurs. For example, we could see on average that conditions uh, related to D3 or extreme drought would occur about once every 20 to 50 years. So by being able to see what the frequency is of some of these uh, precipitation values over a certain period, you get a, a better idea of where we're looking at as far as what the, the, the drought category that would correspond to it is. And these maps show 30, 60, and one year down here in the lower right. Uh, normally I show 90, but I wanted to show a little bit longer time period this time. Uh, well, the center part of the state is showing quite wet and has led to some of the improvements that we were seeing there on the earlier side, slide. We do have some emerging areas and actually some of these are re-emerging areas when you look at the longer term. Uh, areas of concern where we're, we're still in some of the, the lower drought categories. When you look at the one-year map, you can see some really long-term uh, deficits even though we're seeing blue or uh, wetter than normal periods up here in the, like in the, the Northeast, when you look at a longer period, you're seeing some of these deeper reds, even though at the medium term, it's not too bad. And then we're starting to see these things starting to emerge up here in, in Johnson, Campbell, and a little bit into the Sheridan County, uh, the Park Bighorn area, as well as uh, the Teton, Sublet, uh, Upper Fremont County area. And looking at temperature, this is uh, the last two weeks, last 14 days. And on the upper right here, we have the actual minimum temperatures uh, averaged over the 14 days. 
Uh, most of the lows are below freezing. We're seeing mostly cooler in the higher elevation, um, upper green, and then some parts up here in the northern part of, of Albany County. Uh, down fairly, you know, get into the approaching uh, the freezing mark in some of these, these redder areas. But when you look at these temperatures in terms of their departure from normal, you can see that the last two weeks were, were quite warm, nine to 12 degrees above average down here in the southwest, south central part of the state, and up here on the eastern side of the Bighorns. And the rest of the state, other than the, the high elevation, we're looking at six to nine degrees above the average for your, for your nighttime lows. And this is the same, same set of maps, but showing the maximum temperatures uh, up here in the upper green again in the higher elevation. We're seeing uh, heights during the day that are not quite getting up to 50 degrees, but the rest of the state, at least up until the last uh, two days, was seeing temperatures in the, in the 50s. And looking at the uh, departure again down here on the lower right or lower left, you see the western quarter thereabouts of the state up to three, a little bit more three degrees above average, whereas the rest of the state three to six with uh, uh, nine to 12 in some of these areas here in Fremont County, uh, again here on the, on the eastern side of the Bighorns and down here in, in Laramie County. Uh, this map changed considerably in the last two days with this, the colder system that came through. So it's, it's amazing what two days can do as far as low temperatures when you're looking at an average over two weeks. Still a little bit early in the season uh, for, for snow water equivalent, but starting to see some a lot less asterisks on the map. The asterisks that we're seeing here indicate that the conditions are not really representative of what's going on the ground, but the numbers are, they're, they're accurate numbers, but they're too early to really show anything. We're still seeing uh, four of the basins here that have these asterisks next to them, but by and large, the rest of the basins have settled into a little bit more reliable numbers. And unfortunately, they are not that high. <laughs> we're seeing uh, only, only two of the basins up here in the 70s and 80s for, for percent, but it's, it's still really early in the season. So uh, I wouldn't make too much of these numbers yet. This is the, uh, again, the modeled snow water equivalent across the entire, entire state, not looking just at a basin number, but uh, each, each little bit here. And again, these numbers are, are early, but I wanted to at least show that we're starting to see accumulations persist in some of the higher elevations. We did lose a little bit of the snow water equivalent here from two weeks ago. You can see the, the area where we were having snow uh, accumulation, especially in the Bighorns, has, has diminished quite a bit, as well as here up in the, the Medicine Bow and Sierra Madres and in the, the southwest part of the state. And this is showing uh, the snow water equivalent in terms of inches. Uh, again, this is dwindling here a little bit in the last little bit, but you can see that, uh, especially up at the higher elevations, we're getting uh, like in the winds, eight to 10 inches of water being built up, Tetons, and, and then lesser amounts in some of the, the other ranges. Soil moisture, this is in terms of the percentile, which is, which is common for how we look at these things when you're, when you're looking at how, how it influences the drought monitor. We were doing fairly well at the end of October, going into November with those uh, snowstorms that we had, and soil moisture starting to improve quite a bit. Uh, but you can see here, and this is from, from yesterday that we're starting to, starting to lose ground. The area up here in the Northeast is, is really expanded. And then we've had almost the same set of lines down here in the Southeast, but the categories have all shifted by one. So we're, we're starting to see some deteriorations in, that, in those conditions. And here's a few of the, the inputs into the drop monitor that we look at. Uh, we're showing 90 day and 365 day precipitation percentiles here on the top, and then the 90 and 365 day standardized precipitation index down here on the bottom, showing a little bit longer time period this time than uh, the last month. But you can kind of see how these go in along with soil moisture up here in the upper right to make up how, what our current drought monitor map is. You can see it's the conditions here reflected over here. Uh, same with up here in park, we still have this persisting D3 up here and uh, the worsening conditions up here in uh, the northeast part of the state, we could be seeing a return to this uh, expansion up here. 
And speaking of soil temperature and soil moisture, here is the uh, actual soil temperature that we're recording at our Sheridan station. This is about seven miles east southeast of Sheridan. And see temperature, you see that at the shallower depths, so you can see that how it changes with the day as, as the sun warms the soil, it does make its way down into the, some of the shallower depths. But you can see here in the last two or so days that we've really started uh, losing temperature in those, those upper depths of the soil. Soil moisture, on the other hand, has remained fairly, fairly consistent after those uh, mid-October storms where we had, the, uh, had a pretty good a bit of snowfall up in the Sheridan area, it melted, and with the temperatures being above freezing, it went into the soil, which boosted us up a, a little bit here, and then it kind of leveled off uh, going into the, into the colder period. Uh, I usually show this chart here. This is the Thunder Basin grasslands. This is on the uh, Campbell Converse County line. And you can see that the, a good increase here in the soil moisture at several of the depths uh, after those October, over, uh, I believe it was October 12th snows that melted and went in and kind of leveled off after that, but we held the moisture in the soil, except here at the very end. And this is a function of the ground freezing, a little bit of soil moisture when that ground freezes uh, in the recording. But you can see here, this is just in the last uh, couple hours, you can see as the soil has thawed out that we're starting to gain a little bit of that moisture back, but I doubt we're gonna see back up to here again. Another station, this is the state engineer's office uh, station at Elk Mountain where they recently put in one of our soil moisture probes. Uh, you can see, and again, this is mostly influenced from ground freezing, uh, the declines here. Uh, the spikes that we're seeing here in the soil moisture are from, from precipitation events and we seem to lose it fairly quickly after, after the event based on the soil here. And this is that temperature at Elk Mountain and you can see where we had those declines in the shallower uh, soil moisture. It's corresponding to the temperature dropping below this 32 line here uh, for several hours here this morning, it looks like. And again, at Douglas, soil temperature, even, even longer periods where we've been below freezing, and we're actually seeing it down at the four inch depth too, where we were under for, for, for several hours. And this is a map I'm start, a chart I'm starting to generate with uh, showing frost depth where we're getting these uh, profiled temperature stations in. And you can see here, we're tracking along here, uh, unfrozen ground basically, and then a little bit of a dip here where our, our frost depth uh, went down a little. And then here in the last two days where we've had more substantial drops where uh, this morning when the frost depth went down to just a little bit over half a foot. Now looking back at the, the drought timelines, this is just uh, another chart that's updated each time we do this just to show the, the timeline or prog the progression of drought uh, since 2000 in, in, in Wyoming. This shows the the area of each of the different categories of drought, uh, the D0 through D4. Uh, currently, the entire state is in one of those categories, D0 through D4, although the D0 is um, sort of a warning sign that we're going into drought. It's not an actual drought category itself. It's abnormally dry, but it's still a, a, a concerning category. Uh, but the D1 to D4, the actual drought uh, categories, 90, just over 92% of the state is in that drought category, one of those drought categories. And then looking at uh, a little bit less compressed timeline, just showing from 2000 to 2000, uh, you know, current in 2001, showing those same uh, areas of the various categories of drought in the state uh, with time. And as you can see here in the last few weeks since the beginning of October, we have lost which is a, a good word in this case, lost a lot of our, or about half of our uh, D3 area in the state has uh, switched over. And as you can see by the fact that this has not changed up here, that uh, that's all been just basically one category improvement from the extreme drought to severe drought. So uh, we're not out of the woods yet, but we're at least uh, have improved some of those D3 conditions around the state. And now I just wanted to give a little bit of a look. These next three slides are going to take a, a quick look back at the water year of uh, 2021, which ended on the 30th of September. And the water year represents uh, it's a one-year period. It's an annual cycle of the 
starting with the cool season where your water storage and soil moisture start to recharge. Like I said, that typically starts, uh, starts to occur in the fall, winter and spring, uh, followed by your, your warm season where the crops and other vegetation start to grow and use that moisture and then uh, culminates in um, October or September 30th. And uh, the streams are pretty much depleted of any of that snow melt that would have been coming down and the process starts over again. But this is looking from September 30th of this year back 365 days. And you can see uh, for above median precipitation, there's not many areas. This little area down here and on the Uinta Sweetwater uh, border, a little bit here in the central part of the state and a few other little scattered pockets where we were actually above uh, median precipitation for the last year. Uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, there's a lot more areas where we were well below the median, especially these uh, red and dark red areas, which represent the uh, 10th percentile or less of precipitation. And those are, are typically indicative of D2 or worse conditions. Uh, you can see here along the western side of the winds, uh, Tetons, up in the Bighorn Basin, uh, Campbell, Johnson, that up into Crook County, and then this persistent area down here. In, uh, Southern Carbon County, which is, is finally starting to you know, diminish a little on the drought map. Uh, and this just shows two snapshots of what soil moisture looked like in the state on October 1st of 2020, and then at the end of that water year on 30th of September of 2021. And you can see we've kind of shifted from where we had the, the really bad, that second percentile or less, uh, soil moisture percentile down here it was along that southern tier of uh, of the state. And now it looks like we're at the end of the water year, at least, we were that same level was concentrated up here in the, in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, Teton County started out fairly well up in the water year, actually median soil moisture and then about, uh, about the 10th to 20th percentile by the end of the water year. And then just two more uh, snapshots here showing uh, what the U.S. Drought Monitor looked like at the start of the water year and at the end of the water year. And some pretty interesting things on this. Uh, again, corresponding with the soil moisture, Teton County at the start of the water year was uh, not in any of the drought categories. And we ended up over here with uh, at the end of the water year with some D3 and the rest being D2 in, in Teton. The central part of the state, we started out over here with D3, uh, some of the worst conditions that we had seen other than some little D4 that uh, had shown up here in the, the very southern part of the state. But central part of the state, D3, we ended up uh, in the D1 category, so a, a good improvement there. The persistent uh, D3 that I mentioned earlier, we had it at the beginning of the water year, we had it at the end of the water year. And then the interesting one was this bit up here in the northern part of the state where we, uh, we started out the water year with uh, the D3, the extreme drought here in Sheridan, uh, Johnson County in this area here, and the remainder of the north being in D1, uh, D0 conditions for the most part. But by the end of the water year, we had almost reversed that where the better portion was this part here in uh, Johnson and Sheridan County and these areas where we were in D0 and the D1, went into the, the extreme drought category. So uh, that's, that's the difference a, a year can make as far as conditions. And next up after that, we'll have uh, Aaron Fiaschetti with USGS who's gonna talk to us about surface water conditions. Hi, Tony. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'll probably just be echoing uh, a lot of the same things that Tony had to say just on the, the other end was stream flow. So here's a current snapshot of what real time conditions looked like this morning in Wyoming. This is from the National Water Information Dashboard. In the green is our normal flow that's defined by 25th to 75th percentile, which is a pretty wide range. The light blue is above normal and the darker blues are above nor much above normal. Uh, we're still seeing a fair amount of orange and red, the below normal, the 10 to 24th percentile is the orange and those deeper reds are the much below, the below 10th percentile. And then the bright, the bright red is a um, all time low. 
Um, we see a few of those gauges up in the park and, uh, and elsewhere in the state. Um, so that's a comparison of uh, an instantaneous flow compared to the daily average. So it's probably, and I'll talk about this more later, it's uh, daily lows that are set. But I guess the point is that we're still seeing some very low flows in the state. But in general, we've seen some improvement elsewhere too. So I'll get into that more more later. So next slide, please. So here's what it's looked like for daily flows for the last 45 days. The axis on the left is percent of stream gauges. And then the date is on the bottom. We have 51 sites here and shown that we have uh, approximately 140 gauges in Wyoming. So we're only showing sites here that have 30 years of record or no missing values and kind of the trend that we've seen in the last 20 days or so is this presence up at the top of um, above average or much above average flows and even some high flows probably with snow coming in and snow melting and then rain. Um, so that's that's kind of been the new trend here that we've been seeing is some above average, much above average flows or, or above normal flows um, recently. The percentage of gauges that have been normal um, has been about the same since the early part of October. And it's been kind of similar where we've seen a slight decrease in the below normal to the much below normal. And then the, the low has kind of come in and out with a very small percentile of, or percentage of gauges. Uh, we did have one record daily low for yesterday, and that was the Firehall River near West Yellowstone. That's a fairly short period of record there. Um, but we've been seeing less, less daily record flows um, than we were before. So that, that's a good thing. And the higher flows have been a good thing also. But I guess one thing to keep in mind, since we're kind of in a base flow period, there's not a lot of water available in the rivers that a a high flow or a, or a much above normal or above normal flow is not really a tremendous amount of water that's going to build up a ton of storage right now or uh, satisfy other uses, but it's, it's uh, better than it could be. So next slide, please. So this is um, looking at a seven day average and just a comparison of today to the last time I presented. And these blue boxes here highlighted are just some areas of improvement where we see uh, in the Wind River some of the, these tributaries where there's uh, snow melt probably coming off that we see some higher flows than we did a month ago. Um, over in the kind of the southwest corner there, I mean, they're still below, below normal conditions, but they've improved from the the reds that were there before. So there's there's been a slight improvement in that area too. And then kind of down in the southeast corner in the Medicine Bow and the encampment and uh, tributaries of the Platte, you see some higher flows probably from snow coming in and snow melting. Um, so in general, things are pretty similar to what we saw before some higher flows and mountain tributaries and the winds and the medicine bow. And, um, but the, the Northwest and the West Central continue to, to be dry and low. Um, so that, that those areas haven't seen a whole lot of improvement since we, we last met here. Next slide, please. So just kind of looking at a few select hydrographs here. Um, I presented this one last time. Um, in this uh, duration hydrograph is the similar co color coding to what we saw before that green is that normal, the 25th to 75th percentile. The orange is that below normal, that 10 to 24th percentile. And then the, the blues are the above, above normal. So we're seeing the big horn in Cain at Cain is just had a little bump in flow here in October and then just kind of chugging along near the bottom end of that normal range. Um, so doing all right, not doing great, but uh, it seems to be pretty steady right there. Um, 
moving on to the Wind River above Boysen Reservoir. Uh, we see here in kind of July, August, and September flows are pretty darn low. And then in uh, end of September, we get a, a pretty consistent bump and in flow into the almost the end of October where flows were getting up pretty high. Um, and then we've seen flows kind of recede lately back down into that below normal uh, area. So I was kind of poking around on the map there and some of the gauges, it seemed like some of those tributaries farther up were showing uh, better flows, but uh, I know there's a mix of uh, management and probably diversions there that uh, there's, uh, it seems like things are all over the place from much above normal to below normal on the different creeks and tributaries in that area. But it seems like the wind had picked up some pretty good flow here and now is back down into a, a lower flow area. Next slide, please. Looking at the encampment down near, uh, encampment near encampment, um, July, August, and September flows were pretty low, dipping down into that fifth percentile. And then uh, since mid-September, flows have increasingly come up to where they've been pretty steadily near that um, above normal conditions near that 75th percentile. So it's been trending pretty well down there. It looks like water supply has been pretty decent since the uh, end of September and uh, continuing on. Moving on to the Green River near Labarge. Um, similar to what I presented before, we saw elsewhere is July, August, and September, very low. End of September flows bumped up um, into that um, near the median, and then they've continued to slowly increase um, and stay in that normal range and trending towards getting closer to that above normal range. And then looking over here at the, the drier end of the state right now, that Snake River where they've uh, had pretty good flow July, August, and September. There is a pretty drastic drop near the end of September. I'm assuming that is related to reservoir management. And then uh, they've kept, kept flows near that uh, below normal um, for sense that change in flow conditions there. So flows remain pretty low on the Snake River near Alpine, Wyoming. Next slide. So just looking at the this teacup diagram, I know there's a there's a lot going on here between these two two slides, but I think the kind of general takeaway is compared to last month, not a whole lot has changed. There's been no real significant increases in storage or decreases. And depending on where you look around, there's been some minor increases and some minor decreases in storage, but it seems like most reservoirs are kind of, they're kind of where they are gonna be for the winter, uh, minus any, any kind of major change in flow conditions. So. I think most things are kind of probably held where they're going to stay till the spring runoff comes. So in, ge in general, not a lot of change to reservoir conditions, but it seems like a lot of the, the major reservoirs seem to be 70 to 80% full right now, um, give or take. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, next up, we have Susan Sanders, who's with the National Weather Service in Rapid City to talk about uh, weather forecasts and outlooks. Well, good afternoon. So looking at the weather in the future, uh, this is the next seven days of precipitation forecast. We don't have a lot of big systems coming through in the next week. Uh, looks like the the main one would be Friday into a Saturday morning. And then after that, there could be some smaller systems next week, but uh, at this point, doesn't look like anything significant. 
uh, they're kind of moving very quickly. So timing and precipitation amounts are, are going to be difficult to pinpoint. But um, the next seven days, uh, very little precipitation on the plains, the lower elevations, and a little bit more, but less than an inch in the Bighorns, a snowy range, and then possibly up to two inches in the highest elevations of the Rockies. Uh, temperatures are going to be cooler over that part of the state, but actually a little bit warmer over the eastern half. And just like we've had the last couple of weeks, lots of wind. Okay. Six to 10 day outlook shows a better chance of above normal temperatures. And so this uh, does include Thanksgiving and um, near normal precipitation, maybe a little bit below normal for that Yellowstone to Snowy Range area. Okay. And then continuing the same trend for eight to 14 days. So stronger signal for above normal temperatures through that time and that goes through December 1st and then a little drying trend. So most of the state has a better chance of below normal precipitation. Okay. And then the winter outlook was updated today. It doesn't show very much change from the official one that was issued a month ago. So we continue our La Nina pattern, which would bring in uh, below normal temperatures uh, to the Northwest. So um, maybe Northeastern Wyoming, uh, equal chances across the rest of the state. So it really depends on where that boundary sets up. If the cold air comes into the Northern Plains and the upper Midwest and how it shifts, uh, kind of washes back and forth uh, East and West across the, uh, the Northeastern part of the state. And uh, precipitation against storm tracks uh, would favor the, the kind of Northwest third of the state. So, and mostly the higher elevations, which would be good for a snowpack. And then unfortunately, not as much over the Eastern part of the state where some of the uh, higher drought conditions exist. And that's all I have. Thanks, Susan. And now uh, Wendy Kelly with UW Extension and also the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub will talk to us about how to get involved. Great, thank you, Tony. So I did wanna just recap where we started off um, where Tony introduced us to the US Drought Monitor and the current state of it, which was released this morning. Again, this is a weekly map that's released each Thursday. And this is the first time since we started this webinar series that we've seen improvements on the map without any degradation, um, which is really nice to see. So we have kind of spots of improvement throughout the state since uh, last month's webinar. Next slide. So we, we like to start out with the conditions throughout the state and then look at the outlooks that Susan just presented and then transition to roles that um, each of you as well as interest groups that you might work with um, can have to help us better understand what the conditions are out on the state. One program, if you're not already familiar with it, or if you are, but as a reminder, is the COCO Raz program, which is a volunteer program where you can sign up to get a standard four inch rain gauge um, and you install it. At, for example, at my place, it's near my driveway um, and you can report precipitation or lack of on a, ideally on a daily basis. The lack of the zeros entered into the system are really important. And you can see that on the map um, this morning, which is on the left side of your screen. Um, it appears that throughout most of Wyoming, those who reported, reported zero precipitation in the last 24 hours. And you can see on the right side, the active stations throughout Wyoming. So these are areas um, where there are people who have registered their Cocoa Raz rain gauge um, and, and do report as well. If you're interested in this program, you can reach out to Tony Bergantino, who is on today, or myself, and we can help you um, find or get a hold of a rain gauge and help explain the program as well. It's a great way to, to fill in the spots throughout the state 
uh, for precipitation. And this precipitation data is pulled into the data sets that we look at um, that Tony started out with earlier today on precipitation. Next slide. I also want to mention the Condition Monitoring Observer Reports system. And this system, more uh, commonly referred to as the Seymour system, is an opportunity for you and others that you work with to report conditions from severely dry to severely wet, so the entire spectrum. You can go in and the, the web link, the bit.ly link is on the screen here. You can go on, you um, fill out a form for answering questions. You can upload photos as well. And it can be for different sectors from livestock, crops, um, wildlife, and other um, sectors, uh, depending on what type of report you want to submit. The map on the right is showing reports throughout Wyoming for uh, 2021, so January 1st through today. A couple of additional notes on the Seymour system on the next slide. Um, if you do upload photos, it's really important to show comparison photos. So ideally you would have a photo of an area from a more average year or a wet year and then compare it to, uh, for example, this year. And ideally it would be around the same time frame. So November 17th and a, a photo maybe from November 15th of a previous year that was a good year. I also want to emphasize here that uh, capturing the photos that capture the actual resource condition themselves are the most helpful. Um, we've seen some photos that have come in um, and sometimes it, it, it kind of takes away from the story if it's a, a pickup truck with some dust around it. Um, so really focusing on the actual resource itself in your photos or the photos that your clients might um, upload. Regular reporting is also helpful. So I encourage folks to mark their calendar and say, you know, submit photos on the 15th of every month or the first, kind of like when you pay bills of just scheduling that into your calendar. I know we're all really busy. So if, if you can do it, excellent. And if not, we also understand, but it does help to, to tell the story over time. The last note that I like to make is that the photos are um, available to the public. So once you upload them, anybody can see them and access those photos. You retain the copyright of the photos, um, but we just want to share that final point as well in case you're um, asking or wondering, or if somebody else asks you that you're sharing this resource with. So with that, I want to thank everybody who um, presented today from the different agencies, as well as all of you for registering to attend today's webinar. Um, and with that, I think we will wrap it up.